Thanks for coming along tonight, folks. And uh, where Andrew Lee makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. I think it's the third occasion you're here. Um, and I'll introduce him briefly. Of course, he's the member for Fenner, which it is now, but he was originally elected to the House of Representatives in 2010. He was a parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister for a period in the previous government. And of course, is now as the Minister for um, Competition, the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury, and also the Assistant Minister for Employment. But beyond that, um, he uh, was a Professor of Economics at the ANU, holds a PhD in Public Policy from Harvard, and is the author of several previous books. And it says on the blurb of this book, The Shortest History of Economics, which we're talking about tonight. He's a keen triathlete and a marathon runner, which, there you go. So Andrew, if you come up here. Thanks for doing this. It's a pleasure. Thanks uh, for having me along. And uh, I acknowledge the Gadigal people in whose lands we're meet meeting tonight. Now, it's a great book. I read it Thank at the you. weekend, partly in the car with Anne driving down to Canberra and back. Anne kindly drove as I read. But I, I read it, and it's a great book. And it's a huge amount of work. Um, so I'm, we're trying to cover everything from uh, well before BC up to pretty well yesterday. Or last Sunday when you ran the marathon, okay? So, I'll start off with the book. You say, um, right at the end, you say, I said at, at the outset the book aimed to do three things. Tell the story of how capitalism and the market system emerged, discuss the key issues and the people who shaped the discipline of economics, and outline how economic forces have affected world history. So we'll start with all of them. and. Just, and I'll go through the book with you, but remember that uh, early on in the book you say you're a congenital optimist. So we'll test you on that. Now early on you say this small book tells a big story. It's the story of capitalism. Some of your colleagues in the labour movement didn't like capitalism much in the old days, so what's happening here? Now you talk the, uh, the new breed of labour politicians I would describe as pro-growth progressives, Jared. Uh, we are people who understand that the market system is incredibly powerful for generating wealth, but that it doesn't necessarily uh, generate a fair distribution of outcomes. Uh, and in that, uh, into, into that space, there's a, an important role for government. Uh, the welfare state is, is partly set up to deal with the vicissitudes of luck. Uh, somebody falling ill when they don't have many savings. Uh, the luck of a bright kid being born to poor, pa poor parents. Uh, the uh, bad luck that happens when disaster strikes. And part of the shortest history of economics is telling the story as to how uh, steadily over the course of the past couple of centuries, institutions have emerged uh, that help people essentially manage risk. So one conception of government you can have is that government plays the role of risk manager. And I think many of, uh, in, in my party, uh, would uh, look askance at the view that somehow government can do a, a better role in making the initial allocation decisions. Uh, you look at the difference in income between East and West Germany, the drop in income after the Russian Revolution, the rise in income after the, the property, uh, private property reforms in China of 1978, all of that points to the power of capitalism for growing total living standards. You, you do make a lot of the concept of luck in your book. I mean, it, it doesn't take many pages, but it comes out quite strongly, which sort of... E economics is not supposed to be about luck, is it? It's supposed to be about something else. But tell us, because you make this point about Thomas Carlyle, who referred to economics of, you know, an economist as a dismal science, and presumably he would, he would have regarded you as a dismal man. But tell us what you really think of him. Well, Carlyle would have regarded all of us as a bit dismal because he was a racist who believed that slavery should be reintroduced. Uh, the dismal view to which he was referring was the dismal view that all people are equal, regardless of the colour of their skin. Uh, so I bear the uh, badge of dismal science quite proudly, as do uh, many of my colleagues. Let me just break away, away for a minute, because you've got these various breakout themes, and you talk in your book about religion, and you talk about religion in an economic sense. You talk about religion, religion and its relation to competition, talking about the great um, 
religions of uh, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. So what's religion and competition all about? One of the striking things you notice, Jared, is that in uh, the United States, which has a plethora of competition for religions, religiosity is higher than it is in some of the Scandinavian countries, which have uh, a state church. Uh, and that accords with what uh, many economists would believe about monopolies, which is that they tend to uh, drive down total consumption by driving up prices. Uh, competitive in atmosphere was also what prevailed uh, at the time of the emergence of the Abrahamic religions. Uh, and that uh, competition between uh, different religions increases the, uh, the total religiosity in a society. Uh, somewhat to the surprise of uh, uh, some of those who believe that uh, the monopolies would increase take up of religion, uh, the reverse seems to be true. And I think you also make the point that in areas where religions compete, um, religion is stronger. That's right, that's right. And it's, so it's a healthy thing for uh, religiosity as a whole to have that competition, uh, just as it's healthy for the economy as a whole to have competition. Uh, each individual business wants to be a monopolist. Uh, they, uh, uh, much as the Sydney Institute might want to be the uh, only think tank in town, uh, in fact, the Sydney Institute benefits from the competition of ideas and from other think, ta think tanks in the market. And the same is true whether you're talking about banking or baby food or even beer. Now, you talk about, you sort of start off looking at the agricultural revolution. Um, then you go on to the Industrial Revolution, and here you pick up the World Wars and the Great Depression coming at the end of that. So how did the Agricultural Revolution start, and what did it lead to? The Agricultural Revolution kicks off uh, somewhere between 10,000 and 8,000 BCE. It emerges in the Fertile Crescent, uh, a region where regular flooding improved the quality of the soils, and where a number of different uh, crops, known as the eight founder crops, uh, turned out to be quite easily domesticable. Uh, not every crop is, uh, is easily planted, but uh, that region had the uh, good quality soils uh, and, and good quality crops, which made it uh, amenable to farming. Uh, but as farming emerges, uh, you also see uh, it, the way in which it shapes norms. So in certain parts of the world, uh, plough-based agriculture emerged, uh, and in other parts, uh, pe people farmed largely with digging sticks. The thing about the plough is it requires quite a bit of upper body strength, and so it tended to favour the men in that society uh, and lead to greater gender role segregation. What's surprising is that uh, now, uh, thousands of years on, you can still see that difference between countries where plough-based agriculture prevailed uh, and countries where digging stick agriculture prevail prevailed. Uh, there's more sexism, uh, there's more traditional gender roles in places where the plough first emerged. And you also maintain that the plague, the Great Plague, the Black Death, killed feudalism. So how did that happen? Well, the Black Death wipes out somewhere around a third of the population of Europe and uh, as a result uh, changes the balance between capital and labour. Uh, before the Black Death, labour was fairly plentiful and therefore uh, it was easy to uh, maintain feudalism and, uh, and the control, uh, control, under, uh, control it, uh, it embodied. Uh, after the Black Death, uh, you see, wage, you see wo um, uh, workers become more scarce, that labour scarcity drives up uh, wages, uh, and it allows uh, f workers, in some cases, to break free of their feudal shackles. Uh, not that feudalism would have lasted for much longer without it, uh, but uh, the Black Death, if you like, put the, the final nails in the coffin of feudalism. Uh, as it changed relative prices through Europe. So before we get on to the Industrial Revolution, you, you talk about the Protestant Reformation and you say some unkind things about the Catholic Church because you make the point that the Lutherans in Germany, uh, having different belief systems, I think worked a lot harder than, say, the Irish in Ireland. Um, so what, what is it that drove the success of the Protestant nations of Northern Europe is distinct from the primarily Catholic nations of Southern Europe after the Reformation. Well, some of the best work on this, Jared, is, is done by uh, German scholars 
um, such as Ludger Wussmann, who has looked at variation within, within Germany or, or Prussia as it then, then was, uh, and seen that in places which first saw the Protestant Reformation, uh, you saw a significant increase in Bible reading, uh, and that then drove literacy, which of course was an incredibly productive skill uh, at a time when uh, more and more books are being printed. Uh, so Protestants benefited from being part of a religion that encouraged them to read uh, and therefore effectively taught them a, a highly productive skill at a time in world history where being able to read and write really matters. That's because the, the Lutherans and the Calvinists were invited to essentially have their own interpretation of the Bible, whereas the Catholics, the interpretation of the Bible was sort of handed down from, not on high, but from the Pope and those below him. That's right. And uh, Ludwig Wussmann is, is sort of sceptical of theories of this which, uh, which are focused around uh, values and, and have the idea that Protestantism somehow encouraged people to work harder than Catholicism. He falls back on a more standard economic explanation, which is just that Protestantism bestowed on its adherents uh, a really important skill. Uh, it's as though uh, you, you set up a new religion which had at its heart that you had to uh, uh, learn advanced mathematics. Uh, you might not be surprised to discover that those who were part of that religion went on to earn more in the labour market market uh, because they had more of a, a skill that really mattered in the economy. I think there was a theory that Max Weber, the German sociologist of the 20th century, had. That's right. And so, so Wussmann's paper is titled, Was Weber Right? And yeah. it concludes, yes, Weber was right, but not for the reasons that he thought. <laughs> <laughs> now let's, I mean, your book darts around a bit, which is good. Let's talk a bit about the slave trade, because I was surprised to read that the worst slavers or the most the nations most into slavery were the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French and the Dutch. So the Brits aren't in there. Um, what, what, was, what was so significant in Portuguese running slavery? Well, the Brits are early in the uh, earlier abolitionists than, uh, than some of the other countries, although historians recently have been pointing out that there's a significant role of British financiers in financing the movement of slaves uh, in vessels run by other countries. Uh, but uh, particularly Spain and Portugal holding a number of those key Latin American colonies uh, really uh, drove a large portion of the slave trade. Uh, they had uh, colonies where agriculture was particularly uh, uh, human intensive. And so if you're uh, looking at cotton or sugar, for example, uh, their crops were having large, uh, a large labour force uh, is, uh, is particularly useful. Uh, and in the, in the colonies such as Cuba or Brazil, uh, slaves are, uh, are ubiquitous uh, and the, uh, the huge uh, volume of slaves that are tra of enslaved people uh, who were trafficked across the Atlantic in that period by those countries uh, really transforms those economies. So towards the, the end of the book, you express concern about climate change, what the United Nations calls global boiling. But what about the um, the colder period, uh, where the, you, you make the point that uh, the witches and witchcraft got badly badly treated in, in the days of global freezing. Well, this is a lovely finding by Emily Oster, which uh, illustrates the way in which people look to blame others for their misfortune. Emily Oster gets uh, a series of historical accounts of witch burning through Europe and correlates that with the climate data. And she finds that the Little Ice Age coincided with a significant upturn in witch burning. Effectively, you can think of these as societies where uh, things are going wrong, crops are failing, people are hungry, uh, and they're looking for state scapegoats. And they're finding them in uh, single, older women in their communities. Uh, through uh, superstition, they end up uh, blaming th those women uh, who might have lived uh, had the climate been more amenable during that period. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a reminder of uh, the way in which uh, humans can often look for an outside force to, uh, to, to blame. I was thinking as we were watching the scenes of the solar eclipse coming across the United States uh, yesterday, uh, how much past solar eclipses must have led people to think uh, that something was going deeply wrong from the, with the world and, and someone needed to be blamed for it. 
So we can, you move into the industrial revolutions and you, you, industrial revolution, you talk about that leading to an, an urban revolution, but you also make points about wars and essentially um, the First World War, the Second World War, the Napoleonic Wars, the American Civil War, you make the point that, that those nations or parts of nations that were wealthier tended to win because they could do more weapons. Um, so just explain that a bit about about the impact of the economy on wars or the impact of wars on the economy. Yeah, I mean, the striking thing about both the US Civil War and World War II is the huge imbalance of resources between the two sides at the outset of the war. Uh, both the uh, North in the US Civil War and the Allies in World War II uh, had vastly more people, vastly larger economy, vastly stronger manufacturing sector and armament sector. Uh, and yet their adversaries, uh, the South of the United States and the Nazis, were far better tacticians on the battlefield. Uh, so these wars, which in principle should have ended uh, in half the time that they did, uh, ended up being longer because the side which had more material resources uh, was far less effective at deploying those resources. Uh, Hitler's generals uh, win you know, all of those early, those early battles through far better tactics. Uh, as uh, you know, Lincoln is, uh, is uh, bemoaning in the White House the fact that he, uh, he can't find himself a general who will take the fight up to the south. Uh, but ultimately, economics prevails uh, and the side that begins with more material resources is the side that's victorious in the end. Talk us a bit about some of the economists. Uh, I was a bit disappointed. You named a Frenchman as the most influential economist, Frederick Bastiat, which is not, nothing I wanted to read. But also you talk about um, um, Alfred Marshall, a Brit. So, and then I'll come to a couple of others that probably some of us here are more familiar with. So tell us about those two. Uh, well, Bastiat is uh, a... Uh, a remarkable Fr Frenchman who uh, is involved in a whole range of different uh, schemes, finds himself uh, on the run from the authorities at times, uh, and is, uh, is somebody who's important in the establishment of the French monetary system. Uh, Alfred Marshall, much more of a, uh, an establishment figure. Uh, he is uh, responsible for the Marshallian Cross, the first uh, proper depiction of supply and, uh, supply and demand diagrams uh, that you see uh, uh, depicted in every first year economics class. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of striking, Jared, that Marshall is only coming along at the turn of the 20th century laying out the principles of uh, supply and demand. You know, the, the ancient Egyptians knew trigonometry when they were building the pyramids. Uh, and yet it takes until uh, just a, a little over a century ago before some of these key economic principles are laid down. Now you also mention Joan Robinson, the British woman who uh, was a bit of a favourite of the left in Australia, Colin Clark who was a conservative I guess in Australia, uh, he came to live in Australia, and Sadie Alexander who you talk about. But Joan Robinson you speak of quite well in relation to her economic work, but you're very critical of Mao's China, and before she died, she was an unequivoc unequivocal supporter of Mao Zedong in China and of the, and of the dictatorship in North Korea. So have, have, tell us a bit about her, tell us a bit about Colin Clark, who I think came from Cambridge, ended up in Queensland, I think, and has got relatives here, uh, uh, sons and grandsons, and um, Sadie Alexander. So, Joan Robinson was indeed a, a complex woman and uh, she was uh, incredibly bold in challenging Alfred Marshall who was uh, uh, a, a firm believer that women did not have an important role to play within the Cambridge Economics Department. Uh, she challenged him not only through her gender but also through her work and arguing that markets operated less perfectly than, uh, than Marshall would have you believe. She also coined the term monopsony, which is highly relevant in the time when we're thinking about uh, the power of Australia's supermarkets, not, over, not only over their consumers, but also over the, th the people supplying to them. Monopsony is sort of upstream monopoly power, if you like. 
Uh, but uh, yes, during her later life, Joan Robinson did all kinds of uh, surprising things. She was critiquing her own work and uh, she had uh, very different views on uh, some of those communist regimes than most uh, economists would have. Uh, Sadie Alexander was the first uh, African-American woman to win a PhD in economics. Uh, she did really important work looking at uh, low-wage households in the United States, uh, understanding how they managed to make ends meet and looking at their inability, the, the challenge of being, not being able to buy in bulk uh, as being a particular tax on uh, low-income Americans. Uh, and yet she wasn't able to get an academic position and, and end up, ended up working in her husband's law firm. And the third... Colin Clark, of course, who uh, ran unsuccessfully as a Labor candidate in Britain in the and uh, before he came out to Australia, uh, and then came here and uh, was crucial in the building of national account statistics. Uh, so Australia effectively became uh, a pioneer, thanks to Colin Clark's leadership, uh, in the building of national statistics. Uh, first job was, can we measure the output of the economy? Next job was, can we do it year to year and find out how much the thing is growing? Uh, no surprise that a lot of this work kicks off in the 1930s where the question wasn't just how much is the economy growing, but how much is it shrinking? As you may or may not know, Colin Clark became an economic advisor to Bob Santa Maria and uh, much, much dislike from Bob Hawke because he wouldn't supervise his thesis at Oxford. He thought it wasn't serious enough. He thought a thesis <laughs> on the Australian trade union movement didn't quite fit Oxford University. And Bob never forgave him. Uh, any rate, that's... Uh, it does all make you wonder how that world would have been different if Colin Clark had gotten over the line and gotten elected as a, yeah. uh, as a Labor MP. <laughs> or if, or if it, yeah. What if you advise Bob Hawke on economics, perhaps? Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you cover Bre Bretton Woods. Just briefly tell us about Bretton Woods after the end of World War II. So, after World War I, there's uh, a, a move into autarky. Uh, the immigration barriers go up, the trade barriers go up, foreign investment drops. Uh, and after World War II, there's a sense among many economists that they need to get it right this time. They need to use the opportunity of the peace in order to bring countries together and build stronger connections. Uh, so Bretton Woods uh, builds the uh, World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, uh, providing uh, a sense of connection between countries, but also a commitment to a set of institutions that will provide loans and grants and encourage financial stability around the world. Uh, and it works remarkably well. Uh, you see the trade barriers just steadily come down and down through those successive trade negotiating rounds uh, all the way through to the Uruguay round in 1993, uh, where suddenly trade liberalisation begins to stall and you know, we now find ourselves in a, uh, in a world in which if we can stop uh, global tariffs from rising, we feel we're doing well. Oh, I'm going to throw it open to the floor in a, in a few minutes, but um, there are a couple of others because uh, you mentioned um, Joan Robinson. Now, Paul Ehrlich was a great hero, the American economist, and he came to Australia in the 60s and the 70s. Um, whenever he's here, he's interviewed by Philip Adams, and if he's not here, he's interviewed by Philip Adams overseas. But you compare him to Malthus because, as you point out, and as we know, I mean, he... He made predictions about population growth which were massively false over 20 or 30 years. And yet he remains, I mean, not in your book, but he remains a sort of respected economist. Yeah, I'm pretty, uh, pretty down on the Ehrlichs uh, because of the approach that they took towards uh, uh, Africa and towards population growth in Africa. Uh, they advocated against ceasing uh, uh, food aid to, uh, to developing countries, not just Africa but also India, uh, and believed that uh, global famine was inevitable. Uh, they didn't anticipate the way in which population growth would naturally tail off as uh, communities developed social security schemes uh, and people felt as though uh, rise, as falling infant mortality meant they didn't have to have more children ju just in order to, uh, to see uh, an increasing number of children through to adulthood. 
uh, those, those views on population, I think, were Malthusian and, and fundamentally history has, has shown them to have been too pessimistic. Now you just mentioned India there. You, you make the point in your book that India never had a famine when it was a democracy. And you also make the point about um, the famine in the Soviet Union in the 20s and, of course, the so-called Great Leap Forward in mm. China in the late 50s, early 60s, which led to the death estimated now of about 45 million Chinese due, due to a forced famine. So what's this point about democracy? Uh, well, this is Amartya Sen's point, that uh, democracy allow provides a sense of accountability which uh, uh, lets you forestall a famine. Uh, and he uh, is very much influenced by the Bengal famine of 1943 uh, and seeing the uh, humanitarian catastrophe that unfolds in a country in which uh, it's not possible for people to uh, reach out to their leaders. Uh, let's hope that the rule continues to hold. It is certainly uh, one of the side benefits of, uh, of democracy. Uh, and we do know that empirically democracies tend to have uh, higher levels of living standards, higher levels of education. Uh, people in democracies tend to, tend to live longer. Uh, it is not the case that every democracy outperforms every, democracy, every autocracy, uh, but on average uh, you'd rather be living in a, in a democracy even if only all that you cared about was your material standards of living. Unlike many commentators, you make the very strong point, it doesn't take up a large part of your book, you make the very strong point that about China's greenhouse emissions and that if countries like China and other, and, uh, other countries whose economies aren't as strong as China's, if they don't do something about global emissions, they're not going to really be reduced. So China's not reducing much, is it? Uh, I mean, China's uh, greenhouse emissions are de decreasing in the... They're not, they're not accelerating. Uh, we're hoping that they're going to, uh, to flatten off. Uh, but clearly, that's one of the big questions for reducing uh, climate carbon emissions, uh, encouraging countries like China to follow a lower emissions path than the advanced countries followed before them. Uh, so that technology transfer is really important. Uh, China is building huge amounts of uh, renewables uh, infrastructure around, uh, across the country. Uh, where there's, uh, they're also building vast numbers of electric cars. Uh, the rest of us need to be encouraging that process because the, the, the world doesn't care where a tonne of carbon is produced. Uh, it has the same impact on, uh, on global climate change. But China's also building coal-fired coal power, sta uh, power stations, isn't it? It is, and so uh, part of it is uh, uh, encouraging more, of, more renewables and fewer coal-fired power stations. Uh, that's a, a transition that they're on. Uh, everything we can do to encourage that transition is, uh, is important. Uh, China's emissions are, are massive, as you say. Now, you're no longer an academic uh, uh, economist, which probably makes you... But I get to play one at the Sydney Institute, right? Yeah. And you, you get to write a readable book that we can understand. There's only one page I can't... There's only one paragraph I couldn't understand. Oh. Yeah, I'll point it out to you later. Please. <laughs> it's got a lot of mathematics in it, you know. Now, talking about mathematics, you're sort of a model kind of guy, aren't you? You're into modelling, you know, economic modelling still. I think the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the strengths of... If you look at why economics has tell, tended to uh, uh, make contributions to other social sciences uh, or colonise other social sciences, if you want to be pejorative about it, uh, it does have to do with two big things. One is being able to come up with rigorous models, which are generalisable. Uh, the other is uh, the facility of economists with big data. So, yes, I'm a fan of models. Yeah, but you also say that conflicts, pandemics, famines, defaults, trade wars are often missed by economic models. So what's the point if they miss all that? How good are they? Uh, models aren't very good at finding turning points, which sometimes arise uh, either because there's a non-linearity in the system, so the US builds up a whole lot of subprime mortgages, uh, it's fine when the uh, stock of subprime mortgages is at X, but suddenly it goes to 2X and the system blows up. Uh, it's, it's also sometimes the case that models can't predict outside influences. So all of our models for economic growth in 2019 uh, were, uh, were working fine until suddenly an unexpected uh, pandemic uh, turned up in Wuhan and uh, uh, blew all of our predictions for the world economy out of the water. So about to finish, as you know, we s I started off by quoting you saying you're a congenital optimist which is nice. It, it 
really is. Um, you say that like you don't really believe it. Are you, do you think of yourself as a congenital pessimist? Yeah, I, I have a general world view that everything's bad and will invariably get worse. <laughs> That can't be the case. Like you, you, you believe in in markets. You. Uh... No, that was actually a joke. I had. Okay, I, I made it. Bob Sant Maria. <laughs> that was his philosophy. Anyway, um, but you, you said you were, you said you were you distracted me now. A congenital optimist. Okay, but then you come to artificial intelligence, and you say it's a catastrophic risk to humanity, and you say that climate change is bad and could get very bad indeed. That doesn't sound like an optimist to me. That sounds more like somebody thinks things are bad and will invariably get worse. So I still think that an optimist can put on their seatbelt when they get into the car and can buy uh, home insurance. And in the case of uh, artificial intelligence or nuclear catastrophe, I do think we could be doing a little bit more to buy some insurance. Uh, I'm concerned around the potential of uh, AI models uh, to get out of control. There's, there's no other technology I know about where 5% of those working on it think that it could spell the end of humanity. Uh, and that's the share of AI researchers who think that once the system's capacity exceeds that of humanity, uh, that, uh, that, that we're, we're in for catastrophe. Uh, you, uh, you want to bring that probability down from 5% to 1%. That's got a huge uh, payoff in, in expected value terms. And likewise, to reduce the chance of nuclear catastrophe, taking weapons off hair trigger alert. You know, I think of all of that as, uh, as like uh, buying a car with airbags. Uh, you don't expect to use them, uh, but if they're in there, you feel a little safer. And, and in expectation, you're living a longer life. I'm getting vibes to conclude from the audience who want to know what this paragraph is. Um, page 154. System 2 is more rational but slower. When multiplying 2 by 2, we use System 1. When multiplying 17 by 24, we use System 2, uh, and it goes on. And um, so this yeah. is <laughs> this is this please is beautiful. Ex please explain. This is beautiful because it gives me a chance to talk about the late Daniel Kahneman, who uh, uh, was uh, a psychologist who won the Nobel uh, Prize uh, in economics because of his work in establishing behavioural economics, uh, and his. Uh, most people, after they win the Nobel Prize, basically go out to pasture. Uh, Danny Kahneman wrote his very best book after winning the Nobel Prize. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow, and the idea is that we have uh, two systems, uh, a rapid, intuitive way of thinking uh, and a slower, more considered way of thinking. Uh, system one, as you say, Jared, is, is great for uh, working, working out what to do if we suddenly look over and see a truck bearing down on us. Uh, system two, though, is uh, much better in considering uh, whether we should uh, buy a house. Uh, and if you use system one when you're at the auction, uh, you may well make a very big mistake. If you use system two when you're standing in the middle of the, middle of the road with a truck coming at you, uh, you'll make a very bad mistake as well. Uh, and Kahneman's book is replete with examples in which uh, people make uh, uh, system one and system two errors. Uh, and it's, a beautif it's beautifully illustrated with all kinds of uh, case studies, including his work with Israeli fighter pilots uh, and his, uh, his, his time in the Austra Israeli Defence Forces. So, so where did he leave American, wasn't he? Uh, he spent much of his career uh, as an academic in the United States, but he began at uh, Hebrew University and, and of course, uh, spent considerable time in the, uh, in, in the military, as, as most Israelis do. I think it's fair to say the road toll in the United States is pretty high, so... I don't know what that tells us. You think they're using system two too often? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, we're down to go to questions and discussion now. The shortest history of economics. You should write the shortest his history of long distance running. That would be... <laughs> be we would have a nice... Uh, ni nice yeah, uh, it's a good one, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I did pitch it to my, uh, my editor who said that he yeah. didn't think there was much of an appetite for uh, books about the history of running. Oh, he's wrong, I think. A lot of people yeah. do it. Okay. I've seen them, yeah. Um, anyway, we've got copies of The Shortest History of Economics here. It's a terrific book and it goes back, it's a huge amount of work. I don't know how you quite did it with your full-time jobs, but uh, maybe if you've got full-time jobs, you're more likely to work harder doing other stuff. So it's a terrific achievement. Anyway, we've got copies outside for sale. I don't know that you'll sign them. Okay, so now we come to uh, questions and discussion. I'm operating here, Anne and Naomi are operating down there. Anne? 
Everyone's got to be brief and to the point. Yeah. Okay. I've looked through the bibliography and very quickly, I don't see Bernard Smith mentioned there, so I'm interested in whether you think, among other things, that capitalism is the uh, modernity, sorry, capitalism is the engine of modernity, which I think is one of his best remarks. And I'm also interested in whether you're interested at all in um, the uh, Daniel Miller work on uh, consumption. Yeah, so, I mean, thank you, Judith. And I tended, to, I, I had to make some uh, pretty tough choices in pulling together uh, world history and discipline into a couple of hundred pages. So in that sense, I've focused on some of the some of the biggest figures, but hopefully the ideas are in there. And you know, really, the transformation of the industrial revolution, which Jared mentioned, but uh, but we didn't didn't delve into too much, uh, is one of those moments of mod which modernity kicks off. Uh, the agricultural revolution uh, increased total output, but it tended to go in increasing population size. Uh, per person living standards didn't change much. People actually got a little shorter. Uh, the industrial revolution, though, is accompanied by a massive improvement in living standards. Heights go up, life expectancy go up, goes up, uh, infant mortality goes down. That revolution that kicks off in a little island off the coast of uh, mainland Europe uh, is transformative for the world in ways we're still beginning, still continuing to understand. E economic growth uh, is, a, as a measure, uh, inevitably leads to overconsumption. Um, can we break that nexus in that sense? So, uh, what we're measuring in uh, in economic growth really isn't capturing everything that humanity values. Uh, economic growth captures uh, a man who makes handguns. It doesn't capture a woman who breastfeeds her baby. Uh, and that's partly reflective of the fact that it was developed by Colin Clark and others at a time when uh, the economy, economies were much more focused on agriculture and manufacturing uh, than the highly services-based economies we have today. Uh, so we do need to do a better job of measuring other indicators. Time use surveys are a big part of that, and Australia was a, was a pioneer, stopped for a while, and is now back in the game of doing time use surveys, uh, because they capture a lot of the unpaid work in an economy, which some of the feminist economists, such as Mar uh, Marilyn Mooring, have argued uh, may well be as valuable as all of the market outputs uh, put together. Thank you. <coughs> Since 1974, when Richard Nixon took Ameri the American dollar off the gold standard, um, governments throughout the Western world have printed trillions of dollars, euros, pounds, other currencies, including our own government. Uh, does economic history demonstrate that that will inevitably end in tears? Well, Mark, the gold standard was, was getting pretty fragile by the end. In some sense, the idea that the price level should increase uh, at the rate of, uh, of discovery of gold uh, was always a little problematic. And the ability of governments to be able to repay, no, re repay claims in gold uh, was getting fragile as economies grew faster than the gold reserves of those, co those countries. Uh, in general, I think uh, uh, having floating exchange rates has been uh, pretty useful as a shock absorber, particularly for a medium-sized country like Australia, uh, where we would have fared much worse through the global financial crisis, uh, through the Asian financial crisis, through the US tech wreck, if we hadn't had that, uh, that shock absorber effect of a floating exchange, exchange rate. You talked about feudalism and the Black Death. Feudalism persisted in the Russian Empire until the 19th century. Was yeah, the, the experience of the Black Death different then? And could you also talk about Piketty's uh, uh, diagnosis that uh, inequality in Western countries is now at pre-revolutionary levels? Wow. Can't imagine two bigger questions than those, Jonathan. Uh, it is true that the Black Death didn't take as big a toll in the East. It was much, uh, much more prevalent in the West. I haven't seen scholars who've looked at whether that explains why feudalism endured longer, but certainly it makes, it makes sense on its face. 
Uh, in terms of uh, Piketty's uh, diagnosis, I mean, I talk about the so-called elephant curve of world growth, which has seen uh, quite solid growth among the 20th to 40th percentiles of the world income distribution, uh, the, uh, the middle class in poor countries. Less rapid growth from the kind of 60th to 80th percentiles, the middle class in advanced countries, and then huge growth at the very top, uh, the, uh, the, the elites, the millionaires, the billionaires. Uh, so that's seen inequality rise substantially. Piketty's argument would be uh, that need not be inevitable, that it's possible to have uh, rapid economic growth without inequity, and indeed that's the story of many advanced economies in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, uh, a period the, uh, the French call Le Trente Glorious, the glorious 30 years. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that talk, it was wonderful. Um, you've talked a lot about resources having a huge impact, overwhelming resources having an impact on wars and so forth. Um, what weight do you place in economic history for first mover advantage? You know, I think what in the steam engine, I think, you know, actually the, the Nazi Germany and Blitzkrieg, you know, taking advantage of yeah. them being able to decide when they move. Um, what weight do you place on being first? Uh, it certainly matters a lot, uh, Mike, particularly well, in the case of innovation, it matters once you've got patent protection and you're able to uh, take advantage of your innovation for the, fir for the first 20 years. Uh, you know, one of the uh, things that you, you don't get, uh, prior to the patent system, people are trying to use secrets in order to exploit the, the advantage of their invention. After the patent system, you have a lovely deal, uh, share it with the world and you get a monopoly for 20 years. Uh, and you see uh, sometimes the uh, first and second movers very close together, the classic being patents for the telephone, which are uh, all filed almost simultaneously. Uh, I haven't thought about the implication on the battlefield, but it, it makes sense that uh, others were learning from battlefield tactics, um, just as the Nazis' initial advantage on the battlefield was steadily eroded by the, uh, by the Allies. Um, so too, I think we've seen in the Ukraine conflict, some of those tactics that were used quite effectively by the Ukrainians in the first year now seem to be being matched by the, by the Russians, uh, the use of drones and the like. Uh, so I think it, it illustrates nicely your point that there is, there is a first mover advantage, but it erodes. Leon. No patents on military technologies. <laughs> I'm interested in uh, how the United States developed. It seemed to me it started basically with um, <clears throat> the American Civil War, then the First World War, and then after Pearl Harbor, uh, Roosevelt got the leaders of industry to then basically organise the industrial side. Is that how it really turned out? And how, would, how does America at that stage from 1943 on compare to the United States today economically? Uh, well, Leon, at this stage, uh, well, for much of the 20th, 20th century, you see uh, the United States leading other countries in terms of its institutions for commerce uh, and also its deep funding base. Uh, part of the advantage of scale is that you've, uh, you're able to sell to a, to a market you know, now 300, 300 and something million people uh, without having to worry about moving goods across borders. Uh, and in many other countries, scale is a, is a limitation on the ability of firms to grow. Uh, I wouldn't see, I mean, there's certainly a, a role that Roosevelt plays in getting some of those big projects off the ground, uh, but I would see his role more in terms of building infrastructure than in terms of directly uh, uh, investing in the economy. Quite a contrast to, say, the way in which uh, uh, the French or even the British economies are operating over that period, uh, where large swaths, not just of the transport network, but of industry itself are owned and run by the government. Uh, the US has always placed a, a greater emphasis on, uh, on private commerce, uh, and uh, that's, that's its strength for growth, uh, but also a challenge for equity. Um, great speech. Um, Thank you. Thanks for making economics interesting <laughs> for a non-economist. <laughs> um, in a very brief way, could you explain to me when the study of money or whatever we call it went from accounting to a science? So how did it develop into something we regard as a science, economics? 
Yeah, so, uh, I mean, money has three purposes, a store of value, a unit of account, and a medium of exchange. And early on, there is a notion that money needs to be valuable in itself. Uh, gold and silver make up coins because they can be melted, melted down and have an inherent value. Uh, and then there's uh, the, uh, a move towards first minting coins out of less precious uh, metals. And also the Chinese initiating the move towards paper money, which is really inherently worthless and only has value by dint of all of us agreeing that, uh, that, that paper money has value. Uh, and that obviously has a huge simplifying effect on commerce. Uh, so in the case of money, the scholarship is, is lagging probably by hundreds of years, the practicality. Uh, the changes in money really are uh, merchants and governments recognising what will be good for the economy and then it's only economic historians later on who come, uh, come along and say, wow, look at what a, what a good impact this, uh, this has. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the initial in innovation of money means that uh, uh, I don't have to uh, get you to take my cow in exchange for uh, your bush bushel of wheat. Uh, but then the, uh, the, the move towards uh, paper money means that we can do the cow bushel of wheat exchange uh, far, more, far more simply with, uh, with a lightweight currency. It wasn't so long ago that people thought money was cash and now cash is sort of going, yeah, I, I hear. Does that disturb you as an economist? I mean, I think cash is going to be around for uh, a long time, partly because there's a simplicity for certain transactions, whether that's uh, uh, buying uh, f things at a, uh, at a street, s street stall uh, or tipping somebody. Uh, there's also uh, a share of the population who are less comfortable with, uh, with digital money. But it is so dramatic when you look at those, uh, those graphs from the Reserve Bank, uh, the decline of cash. Uh, I'm trying to think the last time I handled a banknote, um, I'm sure it's not, not this month, um, but possibly it wasn't last month either. Uh, so there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a, a big transition underway uh, and therefore uh, the price of the payment system really matters. And there's much more scrutiny now in saying, well, if you're simply transferring electro uh, electronic money, uh, why are you charging 2% rather than 0.2% uh, and that's a healthy thing. But you, you're very concerned about, and rightly so, about equality. It seems to me that there's certain benefits to people on lower income of a cash economy. For example, people getting tipped, low income people getting tipped in restaurants, taxi drivers and the like. That seems to be fading out now because you can't really tip, it's hard to tip with a credit card. That's right, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking the, uh, the only note I have sitting in my wallet is a $50 note, so it would have to be a really good service to, uh, to, to tip the only, uh, the only cash I have on hand. Uh, so those, those frictions are, are going, to, going to be a challenge as we uh, move through to a cashless economy. Uh, but the, the final phasing out of cash, well, I can't imagine that. Uh, and uh, I'm responsible for the Mint as, uh, as the Assistant Minister for Treasury, so uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm probably also responsible for telling you that there are some fantastic collectible coins out there uh, if, you'd, uh, if you'd like to continue to, uh, to keep in the cash business. AFL coins, new sport, uh, sporting events, uh, historical events, they've got the lot. A tooth fairy coin, they even make one, make one of those. We release vast amounts of information into the world through our use of cell phones and through our cashless society where transactions are now all recorded. Is this not going to have a very profound effect on future economic modeling? That vast amount of data that's going to be available for calibrating. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that the Australian Bureau of Statistics used to do is that when it wanted to uh, understand what was happening to grocery prices, it would send people out to look at the stickers on the shelf. Uh, now, every week, the Australian Bureau of Statistics gets a download of every single item scanned in all of the major supermarkets. Um, if it helps you think about the volume of that data, uh, 10 million households in Australia, uh, most shopping more than once a week, walking into supermarkets with, on average, about 15,000 items on the shelves. All of that data is being aggregated, uh, and that's what the Australian Bureau of Statistics is using, as it's producing uh, consumer that, that portion of the inflation numbers. Uh, so we have 
far better data than, than we ever, ever did before, uh, but that's got significant privacy implications sitting around it. Uh, while I think it's terrific the ABS has access to those big data, uh, I'm more concerned about a recent study that uh, Reset Australia did uh, where they set up fake teen profiles on popular social media platforms and got those teens to look at a few pieces of eating disorder content and then ask the question, what does the algorithm then feed to them? Uh, and many of the algorithms then began promoting harmful eating disorder content uh, at these fake teen profiles uh, using the big data that, they, that, that was in their systems and, uh, and extrapolating from, uh, from what those profiles had seen. So there's definitely two sides to the big data challenge and as, parents, as a parent and a policy maker, I'm uh, thinking about both of them. So just a question about um, competition and religion. Um, how well does that theory hold up or explain things in Australia where I suppose we've got as a diverse as a religious scene now as, as perhaps the United States, but it's mm. not quite clear that our um, religio levels of religiosity are too much better than Scandinavia? Yes, I mean, I think it, it goes, it, it explains it in part, but it wouldn't, it's not, a, not the only thing that's going on with re religiosity. Uh, and a rise in secular values it seems to characterise most of the world. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've seen in the data too is that church attendance is falling faster, or attendance at all religious uh, 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 events is falling faster than belief. Uh, so there's a rise in, in so-called nominalism, uh, people who are adherents who don't, uh, don't turn up on Sunday. Um, and, uh, and that's of a piece with the broader decline in, in community, uh, the, the drop in participation in scouts and guides and rotary and lions. Uh, when I speak to church leaders, they're, they're as worried about believers who don't show up as they are about the rise in non-belief. Hi, Andrew. Um, I haven't had the opportunity, obviously, to read your book yet. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I've, uh, I, I, my study of economics is limited just to an undergraduate degree in the, in the late 70s. But um, when I did that degree, I seem to recall that we were spent a lot of time uh, talking about a, a bloke called Milton Friedman and there ain't no such thing as a free lunch and stuff like that. Is that covered and is that relevant these days or is that no longer relevant? No, absolutely. I mean, Milton Friedman is uh, important... Uh, he, he really could have won two Nobel Prizes, uh, one for his work in micro, one for his work in macro. Uh, he is uh, somebody who uh, was always willing to, uh, to think uh, in uh, a counter-intuitive way uh, and wasn't much troubled by where his views to took him. Uh, the pay-as-you-go income tax system in the United States is largely accredited to Friedman. Uh, the system of income contingent loans that became Hex Help in Australia uh, was written down by Friedman. Uh, negative income taxes were a, free, a Friedman idea. There's just so much in there. Uh, and then the contributions on, on the macro side, uh, with which you know, I as a, a New Keynesian would disagree, but gee, he sharpened up the thinking of the New Keynesians by saying, well, why wouldn't you just imagine that people are rational? What, what's wrong with saying that when the government announces it's going to uh, go on a spending spree in order to get the economy back, uh, back on track, why wouldn't the, a rational household think, well, that's going to be funded out of my taxes in the future, so I'm going to begin saving for those future taxes? Uh, it turns out that's not a perfect description of how the world works, but the Keynesian models that emerged to respond to Friedman are way better than the, the ones that preceded him. So he was uh, an extraordinary economist, and uh, you know, as with all so, so many of these people, I feel like I would have loved to have more of him in the book, uh, but that I had a, a page limit. Optimising subject to constraints is, after all, what economics does. <laughs> as you know, you do two pages on Friedman, which is not, which is pretty good for a book of 200 pages. But you do make the point here in the Reagan administration, the individual tax rate reduced from 70 percent to 28 percent. That's a huge change. It's a massive shift, yes. And uh, of course, with that came deficits. Uh, Reagan presides over huge deficits as a result of uh, wanting both to increase defence spending uh, and to uh, and, and to decrease taxes. So you talked about how the ABS is using that big data of a cashless society. 
What about the ATO? What are they doing? Uh, so what uh, folks at the ATO will say to me is, if you're worried that someone might be avoiding, someone with whom you're transacting might be avoiding tax, just make sure you do a bank transfer and leave the rest to us. <laughs> uh, final question. Um, great book. What, what do you want to next? Uh, so, uh, trying to do my day job. So, we announced uh, some changes today which uh, will see a, a diff quite a different merger regime if they go through Parliament. Uh, and inspired by a lot of the thinking of economists about the importance of competition. Uh, economists recognise that while an individual business may want to be uh, the, uh, the, the only one in the field, uh, it is very healthy for an economy to have a range of different businesses. Uh, and one of the problems that's arisen in Australia is a, a lack of proper scrutiny of mergers. Uh, right now, three out of four mergers aren't seen by the competition watchdog. And you can't block what you can't see. Uh, so we're excited by the, the changes uh, we announced here in, uh, in Sydney this morning. Jim Chalmers gave the Bannerman, Bannerman Lecture at the Museum of Contemporary Art, a short walk from here. Uh, and, and that, in our view, is going to help create a more uh, dynamic economy. So having the, uh, you know, it was Samuelson who said, uh, I don't care who writes the nation's laws so, so long as I can write its textbooks. Um, the ability to dabble in both book writing and law writing uh, feels like uh, both a pleasure and a privilege.